Over half of the world's remaining tropical rainforests are in Brazil, mostly in the area called the Legal Amazon, an administrative area created by Law No. 5173, from October 27, 1966, but whose original concept is drawn back to Law 1806 from January 6, 1953. Today, the Legal Amazon spans 5 million square kilometers and includes 10 Brazilian states in the center-north region of the country. The legal Amazon covers 59% of the Brazilian territory. If it were a country, the legal Amazon would be the sixth largest in the world in terms of territory. The Amazon rainforest is the largest tropical forest on earth, with the highest density of plant and animal species anywhere. It is home to one in ten of all the known plant and animal species on earth. More than one-third of all the known living species of the planet is based in the legal Amazon. One-third of the world's trees, 16,000 species, are in the region, in addition to 20% of the whole world's freshwater. This impressive region provides essential ecological services, stabilizing the world's rainfall patterns, and storing massive amounts of carbon that mitigate climate change. Also, for centuries this vast territory has been fixing mankind's imagination on nature with a capital N, on golden ages, and utopian futures to come. Since the end of last year, the Amazon rainforest has again been under the world's media spotlight, with an alarming scenario that may spell out a point of no return in terms of ecological disaster. David Shookman's article for the BBC News dating July 2, 2019, informs that, an area of Amazon rainforest roughly the size of a football pitch is now being cleared every single minute, according to satellite data. Joanna Oliveira's article published on August 23, 2020, in the Spanish newspaper El País, explains that the deforestation of Brazilian forests by fires has aroused worldwide commotion. While photos of the deforested Amazon invade social networks and the pressure on President Jair Bolsonaro grows, the fire that consumes the Amazon region and part of the Pantanal has already reached the triple border of Brazil, Paraguay, and Bolivia, sweeping 20,000 hectares of vegetation. The data are from the National Institute for Space Research, INPE, which monitors deforestation by means of satellite images, and show that between January and August 2019, the country recorded an 83% increase in fires in relation to the same period of 2018, with more than 72,000 fires. According to the scientist Paolo Artaxo, a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change since 2003, the recent public statement by the Brazilian Minister of Economics, Paulo Gages, who publicly affirmed, in a G20 summit, that poverty is the greatest enemy of the environment, is wrong. Most of the deforestation is done by companies and wealthy people who hold power in the region, and have a lot of influence on the judiciary and the executive branch. They simply carry on the invasion of public lands, whereas the public ministry and the police do not combat these crimes. The largest hydrographic basin in the world, with about one-fifth of the total volume of freshwater on the planet. As it covers three biomes, the legal Amazon also represents the largest and richest biodiversity in the world. There are approximately 40,000 species of plants and more than 400 of mammals living in that area. Bird species amount to almost 1,300, and an insects can be numbered in millions of species. The Amazonian rivers contain another 3,000 species of fish. 55.9% of the native Brazilian population live in the nine states that make part of the legal Amazon. Therefore, 170 native Brazilian peoples live in protected areas in the whole region, grouped in 14 different language routes, in a total of approximately 450,000 individuals. It is reckoned that about 46 groups of native Brazilians live completely isolated, in the middle of the rainforest, having little or no contact with white people whatsoever. As put by Abramovite, this is a cultural heritage any country in the world would be proud thereof, and yet it has been systematically destroyed, many times with the support of the state and or local political authorities. Still according to Abramovite, back in 1960 only 1% of the Amazon rainforest had been destroyed. In 2020, the deforestation has already devastated approximately 20% of the rainforest. Abramovay also remarks that, in 2016, under the administration of President Michel Temer, Brazil was the seventh biggest emitter of CO2 gases, with 2.278 billions of tons. No less than 51% of these gases were caused by deforestation. Abramovay explains that, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on the Climate Change, the decrease in deforestation in Brazil, between 2004 and 2012, was considered to be the greatest contribution from a country against global warmth. The deforestation area reached 27.7 thousand square kilometer in 2004, falling down to 4.4 thousand square kilometer eight years after. Between 2003 and 2009, 75% of the increase in all the protected areas around the world took place in Brazil. 
From 2012 onwards, however, the decline in deforestation was reverted. In 2015 and 2016, deforestation increased 50% in relation to the 2014 rate. In 2017, deforestation declined once again, 16% in relation to 2016. Nevertheless, as explained by Abramovi, in only one single year, 2017, the deforestation in the Amazon corresponded to 6,624 square kilometers according to the Brazilian Weather Observatory. It is worth remembering that the Brazilian law determines that the deforestation of the Amazon should have fallen down to 3,920 square kilometers in 2020. Unfortunately, since the 2018 presidential elections, with the rise of the extreme right administration led by Jair Bolsonaro, all the progress and achievements of Brazilian diplomacy and environmental policies have been put in jeopardy. In a few months, Bolsonaro's administration destroyed a reputation that had been built up over about 30 years. As commented by Ivo Lesbo Upin, in the first months of year Bolsonaro's administration, we see a total lack of control on the part of Brazilian authorities, thus favoring a process that may end up in the savanization or desertification of the Amazon. Bolsonaro's public speeches and policies, all favorable to the loosening of environmental surveillance and preservation, lenience towards illegal farmers and hunters, and hatred against native Brazilians and the environmentalist movement, has repositioned Brazil, once again, as one of the greatest enemies of the environment before the international public opinion. Since his inauguration, Bolsonaro has restrained the power of the National Agency for the Protection of the Environment, IBAMA, to inhibit and punish deforestation and crimes against native Brazilians, while illegal burnings in the rainforest and violent attacks to national reserves, including the murder of environmental and indigenous leaders, are on the rise. History has demonstrated that, whenever the extreme right wing come to power, the environment is often a target of choice. Hence, it might be worth talking about how Brazilian cinema had already addressed environmental issues through a catastopian films infused with social and political criticism. The aim of this paper is to introduce and discuss some examples of Brazilian acotostopian films, considering their historical and political background, as well as their critical approaches and some aesthetic features. The first example to be discussed is Claudine Perina's 93 Degrees Tunnel. This short Super 8 movie alternates between a post-apocalyptic, claustrophobic future, and the memories of a life on the surface of the planet. Archival footage describes the 20th century and its increase of pollution. After a serious environmental crisis, the Earth's atmosphere became deadly to humankind, which was forced to find refuge in a fallout shelter. In this subterranean citadel, people recover chlorophyll and oxygen in order to survive away from nature. Mankind becomes a mutant species, as scientists create human beings without noses. Our second case is Jose de Anquieta's film Stop 88, Alert Limit. This 35mm feature film is set in December 1999, six years after the explosion of a factory that poisoned the air with tons of toxic waste. The leakage persists and the city dwellers are forced to pay for breathable air and walk through plastic tunnels that connect the buildings. With cinematography by Chico Botelho, Stop 88 is almost thoroughly immersed in the darkness and closeness of tunnels and decaying buildings. Made in 1978, this deeply pessimistic movie foreshadows some of the 1980s cyberpunk movement in literature and film, presenting one of the first and only Brazilian cinematic cyborgs, a man with artificial lungs. Shot in a small southwestern Brazilian town known for its fog, Stop 88 sets were designed by Alcino Izzo, an architect who was responsible for the complex plastic tunnel networks featured in the film. With a career as a stage director, José de Anquieta imprinted a theatrical mood on his film, while getting inspiration for the screenplay from his eldest son who suffered, during childhood, from a serious breathing disorder caused by Sao Paulo's polluted air. Our third case is Roberto Piri's nuclear shelter, whose plot was inspired by some ideas from the Brazilian physicist Cesar Lattes. After four years of preparation, the film was shot in a studio built on a beach in Salvador, Brazil. In Nuclear Shelter, the main character, Lott, played by Roberto Piris himself, is in charge of checking and handling radioactive disposal on the surface. During his last routine inspection, he discovers serious problems in the atomic waste container. A possible explosion could put the subterranean village at risk. However, his report is covered up by Avo, the commander who keeps people under strict control and unaware that, in the past, mankind once lived on the surface. So Lot joins a rebel group that aims to disable nuclear power plants, develop clean energy methods and conquer the surface once again. Produced still during the dictatorship and released in the same year as Ignacio de Loyola Brandao's famous dystopian novel and Still the Earth, Nuclear Shelter was contemporary with the atomic euphoria in the Brazilian military regime, which had great expectations about its nuclear power plants. 
following Nuclear Shelter, Roberto Pires wrote and directed his last film, Cesium 137, Guayana's Nightmare, a dramatization of real events that took place on September 13, 1987, after a forgotten radiotherapy device was taken from an abandoned hospital site in the Brazilian city of Goiânia. The device was subsequently handled by many people, resulting in four deaths, and 249 individuals contaminated by radiation. In 2001, Pires died of cancer that might have been caused by his exposure to contaminated areas while working on his last film, released in the same year as the disaster in Chernobyl, and about a year after the end of the military dictatorship in Brazil, Marcos Bertoni's Super 8 short film Armadillo Blood is about what if an accident in the Brazilian nuclear power plants in the coastal city of Angra dos Reis had caused a major catastrophe. Bertoni's film is infused with the environmentalist awareness that spread since the Conference of Stockholm in 1972. The first part of Armadillo Blood presents documentary footage, images of a real 1980s demonstration against Brazilian nuclear power plants. Unauthorized footage of Angra's nuclear power plant is repeated throughout the whole film. The shot of an authentic newspaper headline announces the imminent catastrophe. Not even Brazilian religious faith, suggested by some picturesque icons inside the power plant, prevented the terrible accident. Negligence and imperialist interests prevail, embodied in the character of the power plant's foreign chief engineer. Starting in the very secret room where a Brazilian atomic bomb was kept, the radioactive leakage spreads chaos across the city. The ingenious balance between documentary and fiction lends verisimilitude and cohesion to this narrative, perhaps the high point of this modest short film. Everything that was written in those days is preserved in our temples. When the flux of the sky killed like the plague, and when the only survivors amongst us are those with neither education or culture, we must start all over again. Like children with no knowledge of what happened in the past, either amongst us or amongst you. Shot between 1989 and 1993, Atlantis Ocean, directed by Francisco de Paula, featured the city of Rio de Janeiro in a near future, when the global warmth melted the planet's ice poles and heightened ocean levels. In that dystopian future, a deluge left much of Rio underwater, and the once called favelas became the only safe areas for the remaining city dwellers. The main character in this film is a mercenary diver, who had fled from a mental hospital and now dives regularly in search of food and a lost treasure. In one of these dives, he finds an underwater society, supposedly descendants of the Atlanteans. The neoliberalism that had befallen Brazilian society and the slight detour to the political left in 2003, after the election of President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, appear to have quieted dystopian messages in Brazilian fictional cinema for some years. The documentarian treatment of favelas and urban violence in Brazil thrived in that period, in a myriad of films that attempted to conjugate humanist, sociological, and investigative approaches to social inequality and the massacre of peripheral peoples in Brazil. From the late 2000s onwards, however, environmentalist concerns coming in tandem with political criticism reappeared more explicitly in the Brazilian fiction film, in shorts like Claber Mendonça Filho's Cold Tropics, and Luiz Balognesi's feature animation Rio 2096, A Story of Love and Fury. Set in the near future, Mendonça Filho's Cold Tropics is a mockumentary, or pseudo-documentary, about an uncanny climate change in the tropical city of Recife, capital of the state of Parabucu, in the northeast of Brazil. Since the fall of a meteorite on a beach, Recife's metropolitan area has been inexplicably covered by massive grey clouds and constant rain, thus becoming the independent republic of cold weather in the midst of a tropical country. The maximum temperature nowadays, according to the film's narrator, does not exceed 14 degrees Celsius, whereas the minimum usually drops down to 5 or 6 degrees. By speculating on such a weird climate change that challenges the scientific community and turns a whole society upside down. The reporter narrator in Cold Tropics tackles some real Brazilian problems, such as social inequality, homelessness, the lack of proper urban planning, 
real estate speculation, class struggle and reminiscences of slavery in contemporary Brazil. The film thus provides a powerful allegory on the enduring contradictions that have been shaping the extremely unequal Brazilian society. Within discussions on climate change, water has been another major issue. In terms of water resources, Brazil stands out as a privileged nation, since it has more freshwater than any other in the world. However, the country is not entirely immune to the dangers of water scarcity. Despite the fact that basic sanitation is a right of every Brazilian, guaranteed by the 1988 Constitution, the unequal distribution of proper infrastructure across the country, along with a long-lasting history of social exclusion, prevent 35 million people from having access to fresh, potable water, whereas 48% of the Brazilian population live with no basic sanitation. These data converge in a speculative scenario addressed by Luiz Bolognesi's Rio 2096, a 2013 feature animation that revisits the history of Brazil over about the last 600 years through the viewpoint of Abeguar, a native Brazilian from the Tupanamba nation and immortal character who lived through the centuries in search of the reincarnations of his beloved Hanina. Abeguar's immortal journey and his pursuit of Hanina's reincarnations make the story suffused with the kind of spiritualism that often captivates Brazilian audiences, yet this time also inspired by indigenous legends. At the beginning of the film, Abeguar, in his original apparition, first faces the battle against the Portuguese and the Tupaniquins in 1565. A few centuries later and under a new identity, Abeguar leads the Baleada, also called the War of the Bem Tevis, the longest and largest popular revolt in Brazil, which took place in the state of Maranhão between 1838 and 1841. Still young and motivated in the mid-20th century, Abeguar joins the resistance against the military dictatorship in the late 1960s. Finally, towards the end of the 21st century, the immortal Brazilian young man keeps fighting against the status quo in the war for water in 2096, when Rio de Janeiro is a futuristic megalopolis where private militias have the power over the life and death of the people. Potable water has become a precious commodity worldwide, a few drops would be more expensive than gallons of scotch or gasoline. In Brazil, a company called Aquabras, most likely a parody of the national oil company Petrobras, owns the Guarani Aquifer and so earns astronomical profits at the expense of people's suffering. In this scenario, Hanida is an agent in the clandestine organization Water for All and, as any rebel, is considered to be an aquaterrorist. The idea of corporate water control reminds us of Alex Rivera's Mexican-American feature film Sleep Dealer, while the post-apocalyptic Rio de Janeiro somewhat recalls Francisco de Paula's Oceano Atlantis, as well as the futuristic Bogota atmosphere of In August, a 2009 Colombian short animation by Andrés Barrientos and Carlos Andrés Reyes. Você está entrando numa das cidades mais seguras do mundo, controlada pelas milícias particulares. Bem-vindo ao Rio de Janeiro. More recently, in 2020, the short film The Persephone Mission, by Karim I News, presents a second chance for humankind in a far distant, Earth-like new exoplanet. Made in confinement, during the COVID-19 pandemic, this film is set in the year 3020, when humanity would have completed 1,000 years of existence on a planet outside the solar system, called Super-Earth. In 2020, a catastrophic event would have caused the extinction of animal life on Earth and precipitated the exodus of the human species. Opening credits better explain this premise, the move to the new planet ushered in the end of the commodity empire and the capital scene, and the beginning of a new era. Also according to these initial lines, the Persephone mission is the effort of this new civilization, just an egalitarian, to build an archaeology of its past on the blue planet, so that the skies never fall again. By picking up images from the most diverse origins, such as long shots of landscapes, water, land, and air, internal and external shots, CGI, as well as archival images, and vaguely inspired on native Brazilian legends, the Persephone mission formulates the memoirs of our existence on Earth, something similar to another Brazilian short film, Pathways in Search for a Time. This 2001 film, directed by Carlos Canella, emulates a documentary from the future, by using domestic Super 8 archival footage, repurposed by an original voiceover that alludes to an encyclopedia of human history, emotions, and meanings for life. Book titles, such as Charles Darwin's The Origins of Species, or Ignacio de Loyola Brandao's And Still the Earth are mentioned, as well as proverbs and other memorabilia, as if somebody would be carrying on research on the past of humankind, in some sort of moving image archive. Soon the film assumes an overtly ironic tone, as the voiceover becomes increasingly nonsensical, as if there was a glitch. <laughs> Marca o recomeço do programa de atividades espaciais. 
Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. ships like this one and preserve the peace. We have given them absolute power over us. O pessoal chegou em 80, né? Chegou aí. Nessa época nós era tudo mal informado, não tinha televisão. One of the latest cinematic approaches to environmentalism in Brazil, with a speculative, fantastic touch, can be found in a short film that mixes documentary and science fiction, resulting in rather creative work, as uncanny as the reality it attempts to investigate. Released in 2019, Chago Foresty Space Invasion had a successful career in national and international film festivals. It gained important awards in Brazil, such as the Best Editing Award at the 47th Gramado Film Festival. Scripted and directed by Foresty, Invasão Espacial appeared while he and his work team were shooting a commissioned, institutional work. The film crew was in Lincis Maranhenses and, on their days off, they ended up finding the seat of Space Invasion. This short science fiction documentary film elaborates on the impact of the military base of Alcantara, in the state of Maranhão, a rocket launch site which was built in the midst of an inland community, on Quilombola lands. The film makes abundant use of the syntax and iconography of science fiction cinema, including quotes from Robert Wise's The Day the Earth Stood Still, to address this story of alien invasion based on real facts. Apart from being cinematic protests against reckless modernization, The movies herein discussed cannot be dissociated from wider critical approaches to the Brazilian economic, social and political context during the military dictatorship, its aftermath, and the recent complicated scenario. In other words, all the aforementioned SF films can be seen as allegories representing a society under pressure, incapable of breathing fresh air, and subjected to invisible, bureaucratic, authoritarian, and even Kafkaesque powers and threats. More examples could be added to the mediascapes of Brazilian cinematic dystopias, such as Walter Lima Jr.'s 1969 feature film Brazil Year 2000, a highly allegorical work, representative of a late stage of Brazilian cinema novo, in which a World War III ruins the north of the globe and Brazil emerges as a new superpower, in spite of its inner contradictions. Nelson Pereira dos Santos' 1972 French-Brazilian production Who is Beta? also deserves further attention under a cinematic eco-critical lens. This film features a post-apocalyptic world, set in the near future, in which a trio of lovers fights for its survival in a wasteland populated by weird zombies. Shot in Paratai, who is Beta? Mixes up a number of aesthetic sources originated from counterculture, the hippies movement, and the Afro-Brazilian religion called Condomblé. As recalled by Mary Elizabeth Ginway, the first ecological movements in Brazil have begun around 1971, Yet during the military dictatorship economic development generally prevailed over ecological issues. The films introduced above mirror the first signs of this new sensibility concerning the environment in Brazil, as cinematic counterparts of a literary tradition held by works such as Plinio Cabral's 1977 novel Umbra, or Ignacio de Loyola Brandao's 1979 short story The Man Who Spread the Desert, and his 1981 novel And Still the Earth. Jinwei points out that, in these works, Environmental degradation goes hand in hand with eroding personal freedom as Brazil faces the ecological and political consequences of military rule. The films mentioned here are also imbued with a kind of anti-modern or anti-technological discourse. In Stop 88, for instance, the main character and his family abandon the city. Likewise, in Nuclear Shelter, Lot gives up the subterranean city, embracing an idyllic life on the beach. Armadillo Blood also has a remarkable anti-modern aspiration, obvious in the Caboclo the countryman who rescues the power plant employee that had fainted in the sun. The countryman is a real character representing popular wisdom, a knowledge opposed to the scientists and army's pride and power. He obtains all the energy he needs from water power and represents a clean way of life. This way of life, nonetheless, is not free of superstition. According to Brian Stableford, mysticism is a recurring element in literary ecotostopias. And it often appears in tandem with the characters' memories of the past in some of the films discussed here. Thus, nostalgia stands out as a relevant value in all these films. In Stop 88, for instance, it is this feeling that pushes the characters forward. This same nostalgia can be felt in Nuclear Shelter, through the rebel desire for rediscovering the past, 
and in 93 Degrees Tunnel especially through the imagery and the voiceover poem related to the main character's memories. Cold Tropics features a nostalgia for the sun, for a tropical past, whereas Rio 2096 romanticizes a golden age represented by native Brazilian characters and their communion with nature. A romantic viewpoint or even a kind of Luddism can be recognized through the nostalgic treatment and worship of nature in the Brazilian cinematic acotostopias, where modernity, associated with the army and bureaucracy, also brings imprisonment, and the loss of the original ties to nature, imagery that can be translated, according to Jinwei, into an attempt at national identity. The fact that all the main characters are eventually banished or exiled is also noteworthy in the Brazilian acotostopian films discussed here, notably the ones released during or immediately after the military rule. Brazil, love it or leave it. It was a popular motto during the military dictatorship. In the Brazilian cinematic acotostopia, the main characters are always forced to leave their hometown, something that expresses the pessimism behind fiction involving social change. The Brazilian acotostopian hero is, above all, an exile. Nearly 30 years after the re-democratization of Brazil, the acotostopian imaginary continues to fuel debates on the reckoning with the history of authoritarianism and the world's rampant social inequality rendered by neoliberal politics. After a brief period of social advancements in this regard, between the late 1990s and the 2000s, the return of the extreme right to power in Brazil urges a review of all the aforementioned films, as their warnings remain valid in the present day. The acotostopian film resists, therefore, as one of the most structured and everlasting manifestations of science fiction in the Brazilian cinema, offering critical and speculative visions at the crossroads of social, political, and environmental issues. <laughs>